not the Bible, Anthony. You, Luke will share with you. Oh, look at that. Your cousin will help you. We uh, have some young people that are pretty excited because we're getting ready to uh, start our second night of teen revival in just a little bit. Now, what we've been doing today has just been uh, regular Sunday worship, uh, what's been called running the gauntlet for teenagers. It's a little, little bit of a game for me, a little bit of a test, to find out if young people really have as much energy as people say that they have. They say, oh, you just can't keep up with teenagers and so forth. My curiosity has always been, can teenagers keep up with me? That's the thing, you know, can you, can you hang in there? I know uh, there are some teenagers who cannot keep up with me, at least on the basketball court, uh, but, you know, maybe they can keep up as far as staying away. So, Fuji, do your best, bud, all right? Okay. Um, teenagers, you may uh, wonder why we're giving points for you sitting on the front row. It's a good question, right? You wonder? I want to tell you why, but don't tell the adults because I'm going to embarrass them. Okay, so this, this is just between us right now. Here's the deal. Here's what happens in church, in the average church. I always sit on the front row or very near the front row. Y'all ever notice that when I'm in church? Where do I sit? Sit in the front row. Well, there I sat there because Anthony took my seat. But normally I sit in the front row. Here's why. Here's the deal why. Uh, a couple things. Um, when I'm going to be in a place where God's Word's going to preach, I know that it's guaranteed that God's going to talk to me. And when God's talking to me, I don't want anyone else to. Does that make any sense to you? You ever hear somebody really important, somebody important talking to you, and you got somebody going, hey, no, 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 and talking to you like in the middle of it and interrupting? I don't want to be interrupted when God's talking to me. And so on purpose, I try to put myself in a place where there aren't interruptions. Here's what happens if you sit like halfway up or if you sit in the back. Okay, there's always the cute kid. I'm talking about the baby. The baby doesn't face forward. The baby faces backward. And immature adults go, ah, and they go make little faces like, ah. And the baby looks at them like, you're dumb. <laughs> you ever notice the baby does that? The baby looks at him and the adults are like, Okay, if you're pastor, okay, baby's facing a person, a person's going, that looks dumb. I hate saying So don't tell the adults that, but that's a distraction. And it distracts pastor because I'm like, what is wrong with that person? Why, why are they making faces at me? Because it looks like they're making faces at me, not at the baby. Um, and the other thing, here's, here's the other thing. Uh, um, another good reason to sit in the front row. When you're sitting back there, I can see everything you're doing, even when you're doing like this and trying to be sneaky, like doing the eye thing, like nobody notices your eyes are going, going you know, the crazy eye thing. Okay, and so I can see that. The deal that I always make with people is, if you don't distract too much, I won't embarrass you. But if you become too distracting to where I can't pay attention to what I'm saying, then I'm going to have to, for the sake of everybody else there, I have to stop you from doing whatever it is that you're doing, and then you might be embarrassed by the way that I stop. Sometimes I say things uh, rather blunt. Hey guys, come on in. You can sit uh, right by uh, right by Brother Duke up here. He's the man waving me up here. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so I try. Hey, are you looking behind the front? You're getting distracted. No, oh, there's distractions right there. The thing is, when the door opens, there's a major temptation, isn't there? When that door opens, don't you want to know who came in it? Like, who came in, who went out? Okay, some adults don't have the maturity to not look at the door and be distracted. And so I sit in the front row, and I try real hard not to be distracted unless I'm texting them or asking me directions, and I'm going to show them where to sit or whatever. So we're just going to try to start fresh here and uh, get a group of young folks that know it's best to sit in the front row not turn around, even if somebody's moving around and doing something behind. Why? Because God's talking to you and it's going to mess it up. You know, God's talking to you and it's going to mess it up. And I'll tell you something. People that want to be distracted evidently don't want God to talk to them. It's true, isn't it? In other words, if you want a distraction, you're willing to be distracted. You, you don't mind if God doesn't talk to you. And so uh, i got great hope. I think we've got some great young people here. And I want to preach a very, very short message. Is it okay if the message is not very long this evening? Everybody's okay with that? Adults, is that all right? I know you want your money's worth. 
and all that. You want to make sure to be able to stay in this nice air conditioning for as long as you can. But uh, let's read our text this evening, make a few concluding comments as we've been in Jude. And we've been studying in this portion of the scripture. Look down to Jude and look at uh, chapter, uh, let's look at chapter 1 tonight and uh, verse 21. Okay? Chapter 1, verse 21. You see it? Verse 21. The word keep is the first word. I'm about to read it. And uh, to yourself, you read along with me, but don't read out loud, or you'll be a distraction. Jude 1, 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, and of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Now, unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Let's pray. God, please help us to understand the simple truths tonight. Please help us to absorb them in a way that it would help us to be determined that we would keep ourselves in your love. And then God, I pray that you would help us to have an appropriate amount of fear that we would be the ones who would be false teachers or that we would be the ones who would be susceptible to false teaching. I ask your help with understanding now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, this letter that was written by Jude, who referred to himself as the brother of James. We know James was actually Jesus himself. Uh, he was the son of Joseph, who would have been Jesus. We wouldn't call him a stepdad, but he wasn't Jesus' earthly father because Jesus was born of a virgin. And so he would have been Joseph's mom's husband. So, or I'm sorry, Jesus' mom's husband. Jude would have been Jesus' half-brother. Half-brother. Knew Jesus himself and had come to the realization that Jesus was God and that He was the only means for eternal life. And Jude wrote a letter uh, in the manner, in a manner that I really appreciate. He's very blunt. I like it when I know what people are saying. Sometimes, I don't want to say I'm thick-headed or dense because I just don't want to believe that about myself. But sometimes I just don't get it when people are hinting things at me. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I'm pretty perceptive. But sometimes I'm not. And sometimes someone will tell me something, and they'll say something like, well, I'll ask them, how are you doing? I'll say, well, I'm not too happy today. I think they're joking. I just don't get it. You know? Oh, you know, I'm really upset. And they say it that way, and they, maybe they're really upset. I don't get it. I think everything's fine. Later on, I think, you know, they said they're really upset. I wonder if they were. And I find out, well, they're really upset. Or whatever. Sometimes I don't get things. So I like when things are plainly stated. And Jude wrote this letter to the church, and uh, the thing that he said in the church was to the church, he got right to the point. He said, church, he said, I wrote to you to let you know that you need to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Now, we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, and so I can't re-preach that message. But the word contend it means to do battle or to compete for it's a, it's a competition word, contend is. Uh, so contend means to fight. Uh, it's impossible to contend or to compete or to fight for something without seeming to be contentious. It's surprising to me sometimes uh, that uh, when you're actually talking about truth and people standing up and saying, that's wrong, well, that's right, that people say, well, you know, it's not very nice. You know, it's not very nice that you'd stand against them. Well, I'm just telling you something. Uh, guys, God is going to judge everybody. And God knows what's right. And God knows what's wrong. And if God says something is right or God says something is wrong, who's right about it? God is. Okay, so if someone disagrees with God, they're wrong. It's amazing how we think sometimes that it's wrong to say something's wrong. The only thing that's wrong is saying something's wrong. Something being wrong can't be wrong. You can't say something's wrong. We live in a society that actually says you shouldn't say anything's wrong. We actually do. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned a, a couple of weeks ago is that there's a, a, a phrase or a statement that people say 
that just absolutely defies logic, common sense, and, and, and common sense, and drives me absolutely batty. It's this one. Listen to this. Tell me if you've ever heard this or not. Your head if you have. It's not what you said. It's how you said it. You ever heard that before? It's not what you said. It's how you said it. To me, that is one of the most disingenuous, most dishonest statements that anyone could make. The truth of the matter is this. Okay. Would you, will you help? Well, tell me your name. I don't know what your name is. Yeah. Gavin, will you help? That's a good name. I've never met a Gavin I didn't like. Gavin, come up here real quick. All right? Help me out. I want to do something. Okay. Now, I want you to stand right here. Be pretty quick, Gavin. Let, let, let's, uh, let me see your Bible. Let's hold your place. I'm going to set it down because you're, you're going to be encumbered if you have it. Okay. <laughs> stand on the platform right there. Okay. Now, there is something here that nobody here can see. I'll tell you what it is in a little bit. Okay? All right? Um, let me get the store open. All right. There we go. Okay. There's something here that no one can see. All right? Here's what I want you to do, Gavin. I want you to run out that door. When I say go, I want you to take off. And I mean I want you to try to get out that door. Okay? All right? One, I'm going to say one, two, three, go. Ready? One, two, three, go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are you having a seat? All right. Okay. Thank you, Gavin. All right. Now, that was not very nice of me to stop you from running out the door, was it? You guys think about that? You told me to run out the door. Well, Whoa. <laughs> There's a pit of cottonmouths right here. And out the door, there was a Burmese python, there was a rattlesnake, and there was a lion. <laughs> None of them tame. It wasn't very nice of me to stop you, was it? Huh? It was? Actually, kind of was, wasn't it? Okay, now, let's critique the way I stopped him. You didn't run as fast as I thought you'd run. I thought you were going to go all... You look like somebody's going to grab me here. Right? This is what happened. Okay. All right, let's critique the way that I stopped him. Could I have stopped him differently? Yes. Um, it depends on the moment. Kind of, yeah. I mean, maybe. Maybe, right? I could have been like, stop. Right? I don't know how quick Gavin is. I don't know how good he hears. He's running full steam right into a pit of vipers and cotton mouse and there's rattlesnakes out there and a Burmese python and a lion. And I could have said, stop. Okay. I don't know if he had stopped or not. If he's thinking about busting out that door, he might not hear anything. Okay. Or I could have said, whoa. You know, I kind of put a hand out there. Like, hey. Stop. I could have said, stop. The deal is, is that it's actually debatable how you could stop somebody, right? But if I want to stop Gavin, then I'm going to put a couple hundred pounds in front of him. Right? If I'm afraid something's going to happen to Gavin, I'm thinking, well, you know what, the best way, you know, it's, it's all physics when it comes to this. I mean, if he gets going real fast, he might be able to knock this load out of the way. But probably not. <laughs> okay? So I'm going to put myself in his way. And then just in case he doesn't stop, I'm going to get him, grab him. And then just in case he keeps running, I'm going to take his feet off the ground. Like, well, this boy's not going anywhere. Right? And why to do that? I don't want anything bad to happen to him, actually. Okay, so you know, there's people that can say, well, Pastor, you know, you could have been a lot more gentle and stopped and gabbed. Or you could have, whatever. And they can, you can say whatever you want to about it, but actually the truth of the matter is anybody that tries to stop somebody from getting hurt has a good motive. Right? So actually an argument that says that you didn't have a good motive in trying to prevent someone from getting harmed is actually not honest, is it? It really isn't what it isn't how you say it, it is what you say. It is what you say. It's amazing how many times we let people just get destroyed because we don't want to hurt their feelings. It'd be a lot better to hurt their feelings and save their soul. Or hurt their feelings and keep them from getting squashed. Right? And that's the way truth is. There's a lie, and I believe the source of the lie is the greatest liar ever, and that's the devil. And the lie is that you shouldn't tell something the truth 
if it doesn't feel good or if they don't like it or if it's against popular opinion or if whatever. And the truth of the matter is, is that the only thing that will save or help a person is truth. And the thing that will destroy them is a lie. And so the whole thing's dishonest, isn't it? And Jude said to the believers, he said, I wrote to you that you would, so that you would contend earnestly, contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And then he begins to describe that in the church there are certain men crept in unawares. Now, the men aren't unaware of who they are, but the church is unaware of who they are. So they've crept in, and they're teaching things different than the truth. And the truth is all about the gospel. That is, how to know for sure that you're going to heaven, who Jesus is, who God is. Guys, why do you think there's so many different denominations that all teach different things? Is it because there are that many sincere people that have come up with different ideas? <clears throat> okay, there, I, think, I think that oftentimes there are people that really believe that this is the way. Okay, that's a good, that's a good, that's a good point. So how could we know what's right and what's true? If good people really think things, and they all think different things, how can we know what's true? Research. Research? Okay, good idea. Okay, yeah. What do you search? What? Who said that? Fuji. What did you say? The Bible. This is God's Word. God's Word tells us the truth. I sanctify them through thy Word. Thy Word is truth. So this is the truth. So find out what the Bible says. You know that any person who looks at this book and finds out what God says will find out the same thing that I do if I look at it, or the same thing that you do if you look at it. And if we all look to the same place for truth, we'll all come up with the same thing. So you know what you just told us? You said the reason people believe different things is because they're finding answers other places than here. I don't mean to be unnice. But if you're finding answers that aren't here, I reject your answer. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because if people find an answer, they're teaching things the Bible doesn't teach, then, hey, Jose, come in. Then I reject their answer. And if somebody on purpose says, forget about the Bible, the Bible has mistakes, the Bible isn't God's Word, the Bible, whatever, and they teach something otherwise, if someone says that, then they're a false teacher. They're the people that have crept in. You may be unaware that they're that they have an evil motive, but they're not unaware. Okay, so we looked at that last week. We saw the description of the false teacher. We saw also the punishment of the false teacher. I want to finish this evening by looking at a conclusion. What to do if you're not a false teacher? If you're not a false teacher in the church, what do you do? Verse 21, the Bible says first, keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourselves in the love of God. And then the second part of verse 21 says, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. The first thing that a person who is contending for the truth ought to do is keep himself in the love of God. Now, that's an interesting statement because just like everything Jude said, he said what he said and he said no more. He didn't say, keep yourself in the love of God and here's what I mean by that and here's how you can do it and here are five different ways that you could not do it. Right? He just said, keep yourself in the love of God. Why do you suppose Jude used so many, so few words to simply say, keep yourself in the love of God? Because <laughs> he didn't need that many words. Yeah, what else? What? Well, it's pretty simple. In other words, Jude didn't have to sit down and brainstorm and think, okay, what are all the ways a person could get out of the love of God? Try to think of everything wrong somebody should do. Right? Because you don't have to know everything that isn't good in order to stay in God's love. You just have to know what it means to stay in the love of God. Okay, well, let's, let's think about this a minute. If you love God, if you love God, the Bible teaches that God keeps us. In other words, uh, we're sealed by, we have God's Spirit, and then we said, the Bible says that, that Jesus had, has, has kept us, and then the Bible says that God is keeping Jesus in His hand. We can't be taken out. Nope, nothing is able to snatch us or pull us away from God. What is able to separate us from the love of God? The Bible says nothing can. Nothing's able to separate us from the love of God. Okay, so if Jude is telling us to keep ourselves in the love of God, is he talking about God loving us or is he talking about us loving God? Okay. Yeah, because God's always going to love you. 
So they, it's us loving God. Okay? What are some things to do in order to keep yourself in love? Let me illustrate something for you. Uh, I, don't, I don't need, we don't have time to illustrate too much, so I'll just give you a scenario. And I think you guys know human nature well enough that you'll understand. I think everybody here does. Okay. What makes a toddler in the nursery want a toy more than anything else? Someone else has it. <laughs> Some other kid plays with a toy, right? Try when a kid, say, say, uh, a little boy brings his doll to the nursery. Wait, boys don't do that. <laughs> uh, a little girl brings her doll to the nursery. Okay, she sets the doll down. Or if she's Susanna, she sets the doll down. <laughs> I said Susanna be pretty or very like, <laughs> whatever. Okay, so she sets her doll down. What makes her want to pick that doll up more than anything else? Some little boy goes over and like, yeah, touch that doll. She wants it. Mine. It's my doll. Little girls love their dolls. Little boys love their, you know, cars or trains or machine guns or whatever. <laughs> um, the, the deal. That's the deal. So what makes somebody want something? Well, when somebody else wants it for one thing. How do you keep yourself in the love of God? Keep your hands on it. Keep a hold of it. Right? In other words, it seems like the more somebody else wants something, the more we want it. Um, I could illustrate it this way. I have a 1971 Chevelle. Probably most of you guys don't know what that is. But it's, it's a cool car. Before all the cars you know about were cool, my car was cool. Way before. You know what a 71 Chevelle is? What? It's going to have an LS in it. It came way before the LS. LS9 is what it's going to have in it. Okay. Okay. Um, my 1971 Chevelle is a pretty cool car. I used to love my Chevelle. Matter of fact, when I was in college, I took it to college my senior year. When I was home, I was always you know, doing little things to modify it or work on it or whatever, to make it a little bit faster and so forth. Uh, Sixteen years ago, in some, some days, I got married. And the year after I got married, I went to Kansas where my Chevelle is in a shed. And I, had a, I put a pretty, pretty powerful engine in it. It was just a built 350, and I swapped the engine. I got it running per yeah, it was a small block. I, I got it running perfectly, and I parked it in the shed. And I just started it like a couple of weeks ago, the first time in the last 15 years since I parked it in the shed. I'm kind of thinking about building an LS and putting in it right now, but I'll be honest with you, I haven't thought about my Chevelle most of the time for 15 years. The reason I haven't really thought about my car is because it's been sitting in a shed in Kansas and I haven't been anywhere near it. The other day I drove it, my wife drove it, drove it down my dad's runway. You know, drove a little crazy, had some fun with it. And uh, we had a good time. We're like, yeah, this is fun. We were thinking about, hey, we got to drive this sometime. What made me think about that? Well, I got it started, went out, drove it a little bit. You guys, I'll just tell you something. If you. If you keep yourself in the love of God, the way to do that is to stay near God. You get near God, you're going to find out, man, God is love. God, man, it's wonderful to know that I'm loved. It's wonderful to have a relationship with God. It's wonderful to know that the Creator of the world is my Father, that Jesus Christ is my friend. And you get in God's Word, you get near God, you'll keep yourself in the love of God. But you want to get out of the love of God, you want to, you just, just get away. Just stay away. Don't go to church. Don't go to places where the Bible is taught. Don't read your Bible. Don't pray. Don't do business with God. Don't deal with spiritual things. In other words, God's love for you won't change, but you get away from God, and you will be keeping yourself out of the love of God. It's just about that simple. All kinds of things could keep you out of the love of God. And I, I can only, I only gave one example of something, but the reality of it is it's just that simple. Okay, uh, keep yourself in the love of God. The Bible says, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. That's a long sentence that simply says, look, look for eternal things. Keep your mind on the fact that life is short, eternity is long. Okay, a couple of other things. Now, I want to answer the question, what to do about false teachers. And basically, there's two things that we're supposed to do about false teachers. Verse 22, the Bible says, of some have compassion, making a difference. You ever, ever seen somebody that acted up and uh, they got yelled at? When they got yelled at, 
It just made them more angry. Or see somebody like that. Maybe some of you guys shouldn't be like that. No, nobody hears like that. Nobody hears like that. But you may have seen somebody like that. You may know somebody. It seemed like it seemed like maybe they're not right, but if you yelled at them, they just made them madder, more angry, and they, things just got worse, right? Sometimes with false teachers, sometimes it's possible just because of the way that you deal with them to push them the wrong way. I've seen it, man. I, I, it's kind of tough sometimes working with kids, knowing everybody has a different personality and working with adults who are even tougher than kids that have different personalities. And you just really don't know how somebody's going to respond to something. One of the best ways that you can respond to somebody that's wrong about something is just to respond with compassion. Compassion. A person who's compassionate understands where the person's coming from to a degree. Doesn't mean you think they're right, but you understand where they're coming from. In my experience, I've seen people that are wrong about things, even wrong about God. But I can see where they're coming from. I'm not more compassionate than God is. I don't think that I am. But I've been able to respond to people by just saying, well, I understand where you're coming from. And I feel your pain. But you still have to consider what the truth is. And I've just tried to be very, very kind because the person is in pain or the person is hurting. They're not right, reacting right. You ever see somebody who's hurting and doesn't know how to act when they're hurting? A lot of us are that way. Sometimes false teachers have a motive and it isn't so much that their heart is just against God or they're just evil. It's just that maybe they've responded wrong to something. I've seen people, they've, they've believed the wrong thing about Bible doctrine, Bible teaching, and so then they've had bad consequences happen. And because they really believed what they believed, they're actually angry with God or they were angry at the Bible or they were angry at Christians because they really believed something. Well, I can understand they're still wrong. But I can understand where they're coming from, can't you? And so the Bible says for some people, some false teachers, some people that have, uh, maybe they're not the false teacher, but they follow the false teacher, and pretty soon they're going to be the false teacher themselves, then the way to respond to them is to have compassion. Okay, it's not compassion to say, I don't know how anybody can be so dumb. Right? You ought to know better. How many of you, how many of you adults and kids here like the phrase, what were you thinking? <laughs> How helpful is a phrase like, you like that? You like when somebody asks you what you were thinking? You did something wrong, right? You realized after you did it, it was stupid. It had bad results. And then somebody comes and says, what were you, my mom used to say, start off this way. She would say, what were you thinking? And then she would elevate it a little. Tell me what you were thinking. And then she would go to the shriek, tell me what were you thinking? I never knew a good answer to that question. <laughs> I finally learned, I'm just stupid. I didn't know. I don't know, okay. Is that compassionate? Is it compassionate when somebody does wrong and has consequences, or somebody does wrong and you're trying to talk to them, and you tell them, hey, hey, blockhead. Hey, stupid. Hey, dunderhead. Hey, knucklehead. Hey, whatever. I don't know what the modern vernacular is for. I looked up some old terms, something I didn't recite them by now. But, uh, kind of caught in the middle of old and young. Yeah, Dunderhead, that's a good one, isn't it? Look it up sometime. All right. If some have compassion making a difference, that's the first way that you can win someone who's caught up in false teaching or someone who is a false teacher just by being compassionate. That's what the Bible says. You keep yourself in the love of God so that you don't fall prey to the same thing and then have some compassion for someone who's been a false teacher. There's a second method, and that's all we're going to look at tonight. The Bible says in, in verse 23, and others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Okay, so it's a fire out there. Gavin's about to run out into the fire. Okay? Now, he might be really determined. He might, it might, he might be a dunderhead for all I know. Uh, you know, he's... He's, he's not thinking straight. Maybe he's disoriented. Maybe he knows there's a fire somewhere. And somebody screams fire, but the fire's out there. We need to go out that way. Or that way. Okay, so Gavin is like, fire! And he starts to take off that way. And I know the fire's out there. 
Okay, so I try to stop Gavin. And Gavin click, kicks and claws and bites. I mean, somebody my size picks you up and you shouldn't be picked up by him, okay? <laughs> Tears the flesh out. Whatever. Um, but uh, so he gets, he gets grabbed. Okay, he kicks and he claws and he bites. And he starts, he's got a big jacket on or he's got, you know, a cool hoodie on. And he starts to get away and I'm trying to get a hold of him. And he starts taking off and I grab a hold of his hoodie and the hoodie rips off of him. And I take the hoodie and I chuck it in the fire and grab again. And I get Gavin right before he goes out that door and I get him back. <clears throat> Push him that way. And I save him. And I burn his hoodie. The Bible says some. It says just do whatever it takes to save them. When they're false teachers. I mean, just, just go after them. Maybe his, maybe his hoodie's on fire. And I just take that thing I throw it right in the fire. The Bible says hating even the garments that are garments clothing that are spotted by the flesh. In other words, whatever you have to do to save a person, do it. If it means roughing them up, you know, sometimes a little bit of an intervention is a help for some people, just some hardcore truth. Sometimes people just, they're just, they're in a mess and they're deceived and sometimes you just kind of got to hit them hard. Got to kind of get personal. Got to tell them things that shock them a little bit, not in a mean way, but are true. Why? Because you don't want them to be destroyed. And folks, here we see is our conclusion to Jude that this epistle which is written it seems so hard, so harsh, so abrupt when it says, I wrote to you that you would earnestly contend for the faith. I mean, it just seems like, all right, Duke's up. Ready to fight. Okay? And then it seems like it's just all mean. But when you get to the end of it, it ends up with keep yourself in the love of God and then it says, be compassionate if that will win people. And if being compassionate doesn't win people, just win them. Just win them. And i got to tell you something. That seems pretty kind to me. Because if a person's a false teacher, ultimately, they're going to destroy others, aren't they? A false teacher's going to teach others things that's going to hurt them, that will hurt them. But you know who ultimately will be destroyed? Who ultimately will be judged? false teacher himself. That's a very compassionate thing to save somebody from error. Alright, that's the message this evening. Let's pray and thank God for what He taught us. God, I thank You for this truth. And I pray that You increase it in our hearts. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Alright guys, you're dismissed. We're going to start in about oh, eight minutes or so. And that's it. Oh, I can't get on that thing. I just want to like that.